We're going to start the program tonight with a conversation with the man who has probably been more deeply involved in U.S.-China business and economic relations uh, over the course of the last 40 years than anyone else uh, uh, in, in the country. And we're very honored to have him here. Uh, he first went to China in 1975. Uh, early on, he became friends with uh, Zhu Rongji and uh, was appointed to the, uh, when he was uh, in Shanghai and was appointed to the Shanghai Advisory Council. He headed the US-China uh, uh, Business Council at the time that China was brought into uh, the World Trade Organization. Uh, and just last year, Xi Jinping honored him with the China Reform Friendship Medal, one of only two Americans to uh, receive that medal. So we're very fortunate to have him here to get his views on the U.S.-China relationship. And Hank Greenberg, can you please join me here on stage? Great to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. I, I am told you had a birthday on Saturday. Who told you? <laughs> I have sources. Can we say which one? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then we'll move right on from there. But uh, 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 thanks, for, thanks for being here. Can you talk about that 1975? very early, there weren't a lot of Americans traveling to uh, China in 1975. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, you gotta go back. We're cel our company is celebrating this year our 100th anniversary in China. It was started by C.V. Starr, and uh, he had to leave uh, China during World War II, came back, and then the, the uh, Chinese had their own revolution, they had to leave again, he never went back. But I believe, I was then running the company, uh, I believe that you couldn't keep a country like China out of the world trading system. Sooner or later, uh, it would be, uh, it, it opens doors. <clears throat> so, uh, and we had business all through, uh, all through Asia, almost every country, and I was in that part of the world at least three or four times a year, and I began stopping in China. Um, there was only one insurance company at that time, the People's Insurance Company was a tiny company. <clears throat> uh, we helped them learn something about insurance, underwriting, and, um, and it started from there. And I'd stop every year and uh, got to know uh, many of the people and became very friendly with uh, Zhu Rongji, <clears throat> who was then uh, mayor of Shanghai. Um, and uh, we became friends. I helped them start something called IBLAC. Uh, which was designed to attract uh, foreign investment in Shanghai. We did that very successfully. In fact, we're celebrating the 31st anniversary this fall of that organization. So, so because of your, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, because of your friendship with Zhu Rongji, you were able, uh, with your former company, AIG, you were able to get the first 100% license for a foreign insurance company in China. It took 20 years. It took 20 years. And ha it hasn't been repeated since, has it? Uh... Uh, not completely. It's, be, it's on the track of doing so. Uh, we had a company called AIA. It was a Hong Kong life company, operated throughout Southeast Asia. It took me 20 years to get them into China. It's done a great job. We entered, uh, uh, the Chinese life insurance industry was very tiny at the time. It began to grow as time went on, but it was very inefficient. Um, they had employees selling life insurance, and they got paid whether they sold anything or not. In the United States and many other countries, you have an agency, a agency system. These are agents who represent the company. They get a commission if they sell something. If they don't, uh, they get nothing. And uh, so we introduced that system the president of China at the time told me we created a million jobs in China because a lot of people wow. left what they were doing and became agents of the company. And that's grown enormously since then. 
So let's, you, you played a very active role, as I said earlier, in, uh, in admitting China to the World Trade Organization. There was a lot of controversy at the time about that. Uh, you felt and argued at the time that bringing China into the global economic system would lead to more liberalization. Has it worked the way you thought it would? Not completely. Uh, as we all know, uh, there's been uh, difficulties in the current one, which I'll comment a little later on. <clears throat> but um, I didn't ex we, we didn't expect that there'd be a dramatic change overnight. Uh, China had never been in the world trading system. They didn't know how it operated. Uh, uh, they uh, wanted to learn. But I believe that a million, four, a billion, four hundred million people would not be kept out of the world trading system indefinitely. And the sooner we got working with them, the better it would be for everybody. And many learned how to do business in, in an open market. It wasn't universal. You have a billion, four hundred million people. You have different viewpoints, obviously. And so, uh, and China didn't uh, adhere to all the rules of the, of, of the world trading system. Uh, we know that. And uh, they've been scolded about that. And if they want to make a change, they have proper ways of doing it. But, but you have no regrets? No. Okay. No. You, How do you keep a billion, four hundred million people <laughs> out of anything? <laughs> you, you, you wrote in, in the Wall Street Journal last year that, uh, uh, and this is a quote, uh, discriminatory, discriminatory treatment of foreigners is embedded in the Chinese bureaucracy. Can you talk about what you mean by that? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, China did not invite foreign companies in China uh, to operate in China for many, for many generations. Uh, the Middle Kingdom, there are very few companies that were uh, foreign companies doing business in China. They were scattered in just uh, a, a few places. And then, of course, uh, there was a time when uh, China didn't have any control over many things that were going on in their country. Um, what I said also in that, uh, you're referring to an op-ed that I wrote. That's right. The, the U.S. did a great deal to help China over the years. We spilled a lot of blood on behalf of China during, during and after World War II. Um, and we helped them when, when China began to open its market. Uh, when I first went in 75, there was very little trade between anybody in China. Uh, and so uh, we had tariffs of uh, almost nothing to help them get started. And um, of course, it's one thing when you help them when they didn't have any, any, uh, any foreign trade to speak of. But today, it's a hell of a lot different. The second largest economy in the world. And soon to be number one. It has to be. A billion, four hundred million people, we have 300 million as a country. And so clearly there'll be, there'll be a day, whether it's next year or, or five years from now or whatever, China will be the largest economy in the world. Unless there's some kind of a, a change that's dramatic. And I don't see that happening right now. Yeah. So can we talk about the current uh, uh, trade spat, which is very much in the news today, given the drop in the stock market? I want to ask you, first of all, do you think the issues that President Trump has raised in these discussions are the right issues? Look, I think that uh, uh, for years now, uh, since China began to open up, uh, it, it, it means one thing to foreigners and something different to China. Uh, and that's been true for a long time. It took me 20 years to get a life license. <clears throat> and um, really the issue is um, the foreigners in the United States uh, in particular expect to be treated the same as Chinese companies are treated in the United States. That's one of the demands that the trade has um, been negotiating. And um, there was an agreement that, would, that this would happen. Um, and so what happened in the, in the current round of discussions, as I understand it, um, there were changes that were recommended 
by, China, by Americans uh, about change that China had to make. Now remember in China, the large companies in China are owned by the government. Uh, it's not a, a free market as we know it. The government owns most of the large uh, Chinese uh, commercial companies. When they saw the changes that were being recommended, which would require a change in the law to implement those changes, they rebelled. They rebelled. And uh, that's what happened. And of course, uh, President Trump uh, believed that they had a deal. It wasn't going to be implemented the way it was supposed to be. And hence, he said what he said in a tweet. And if the deal is not going to be implemented as agreed, um, he would raise tariffs. Right, okay, I'm going to come back to the tweet in a minute. But I, I, we ha actually have a, at Fortune, we have a survey of Fortune 500 CEOs that's in the field right now. We won't have full results until uh, next week. But I can tell you from the early results, 80% of the CEOs who've responded so far of large American businesses agree with agree with the president's overall policy towards China. You would be in that camp. Yeah. OK, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think uh, if we don't do that, if we don't have equal treatment, uh, it's going to always be one-sided. And uh, I spent many, many years um, trying to build a property casualty company in China, and we have one. Um, it does reasonably well, but it's a uh, it's never going to be huge because we don't have the same rights uh, as a Chinese property casualty company. Uh, and uh, although I must say that uh, they tried. And I can tell you also that those who, who were in, in Chinese government at the time um, and wanted to help us get the life license and, and, uh, and a property casualty license, uh, uh, were criticized by many of their countrymen uh, for doing that, even though we did so much to help China open its doors. And uh, as you pointed out, I worked for 40 years to help China. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but it was, it was one-sided. And having said that, we're, we're treated better than any other foreign company that I know of. And in the process, you gained a lot of experience in negotiating with the Chinese, both at the uh, private level and the government level. Uh, do you think uh, uh, the tweet that came out this week is an effective tactic in negotiating with the Chinese government? I think the, the question is going to be, how much did uh, President Xi get involved uh, in, the, uh, in the implementation of the agreement that was made? Uh, because there were a lot of uh, large companies, government-owned, that would be affected by the changes. And Obviously, that information trickled down to the president. Now, did he get personally involved? We don't know yet. Yeah. Do you think there will be a deal? I like to believe there will be. That's in everybody's interest to have that. So you didn't sell all your stocks today? <laughs> I'm holding on. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, oh, you got a lot of people in this room who are either doing business in China, want to do business in China, looking to expand in China. What would your advice to them be? You have to have a long-term view. That's number one. Uh, and, you, and you have to be patient. And uh, if you need help, come to us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can help you. Uh, we, insure, we insure a lot of American and foreign companies in China. Uh, and we have pretty good relationships with, with uh, senior Chinese. I'd say probably better than anybody, uh, any foreigner. And, um, and we've helped China, uh, uh, it, it, there's no question about it. And they recognize that. And so the, the, you gotta be patient, but there comes a time when you have the second largest economy in the world, soon to be number one, they can have a closed market and assume that Chinese companies would treat the same as American companies here, but American companies cannot be treated the same as Chinese companies in China. And not just American companies, uh, companies from any country has to have the same rights as Chinese companies, assuming that they treat Chinese companies fairly in their own country. 
I have one last question, and it's kind of a personal question. I'm not going to tell people how old you are, but you spent three decades building AIG into the uh, what is the largest insurance company in the world, right? That's right. And then you left and you created a new company. You left under difficult circumstances, created a new company, CV Star, and have built it into a powerhouse over the course of the last uh, uh, 15 years or so. Less than that. Less than that. Uh, it was a very impressive accomplishment. Do you ever think about retiring? I'd be bored to tears. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky for all of us, you aren't. Thank you very much. You're welcome.